So we talk about the uh, external factors will impact bacteria grow and survive. This is another major Im impact for the bacteria survive, which is oxygen. So requirements of oxygen. Okay, here is something. The glass, uh, the slides looks a little bit complicated. There is uh, five different categories. But we can uh, talk about this a little bit simple. So based on the requirement of the oxygen, the bacteria basically have a three category. So number one is aerobic bacteria. Number two, I wrote on the bottom, actually is number three, which is anaerobic bacteria. And there is something right in the middle, we call it a facultative. So let's talk about these three first, then we talk about the others. So first of all, some of the bacteria is streak. You can even write like streak. Uh, strictly aerobic bacteria. These bacteri bacteria must use oxygen to grow, to survive and grow. The reason is that if you remember electron transport chain, so if, you talk, if we talk about this, which is usually the uh, NADH, then goes to uh, FAD, then goes to uh, FMN, FES, the complex, then go to cytochrome C, A, A3, and the last one will be oxygen. And during this electron transport chain, the final electron acceptor is oxygen. So some of the bacteria, they must use oxygen. If they do not have oxygen, this bacteria will not survive. For example, Cetomonas. We will mention this and use the bacteria in the lab. This is a sporage bacteria and a little bit of light yellow color. So we call it a Cetomonas fluorescence. And the pathogen what we will do in the lab is Cetomonas aerogenizer. This is a streak aerobic bacteria. Must, must use oxygen. Then, there is another big category is anaerobic bacteria. For example, clostridium. These type of the bacteria will not survive. In the presence of oxygen. So say the very simple. Oxygen will kill them. Now why then there's a question? The reason is during the electron transport chain or during the bacterial metabolic process or the, their life cycle, we just say simply, there is some of the toxication or toxic chemicals will be generated. For example, O2 plus dots, we just say it. That's super oxidate. For example, H2O2, hydrogen perioxide. These type of the chemicals will have a toxication impact for the bacteria survive. So for the bacteria, they must have those enzymes can hydrolyze them or degrade them. There is a two major enzymes they must have is number one, SOD. Super oxidize, oxidase, thus mutase. Because once you have SOD, this super oxygen or super oxide oxygen, you could become just general oxygen and generate the water, which means it neutralized. And H2O2, hydrogen perioxide, rely on an enzyme called a catalyst. We'll talk about this in the lab also. We'll become oxygen and water. Then it can be hydrolyzed. And this is usually released. Therefore, 
where the bacteria during their life cycle can survive in the presence of oxygen depends on whether they have these two enzymes. Sometimes they have both, sometimes they don't have any of them, some, sometimes they have one of them. So very obviously, if aerobic bacteria, they must have superoxidase, dust mutase, SOD, and a catalyst. For anaerobic bacteria, why they cannot survive in the presence of oxygen? Because they do not have SOD and, and the catalyst. So that means if there is an oxygen there, they use it, they're going to generate toxication material, then the bacteria will be dead. Now there is some bacteria in the middle, right in the middle, we call it a facultative bacteria. They can survive in the presence Uh, P-R-E-N-S, presence or absence of oxygen, but grow better with oxygen. And the facultative bacteria is a major category, actually. For example, when we talk about E. coli, we talk about salmonella, we talk about listeria, bacillus, all these are facultative bacteria, which means they can grow in the presence, absence of oxygen, but grow better with oxygen. So these three are major categories. Now, in our slides, we just talk about microaerophilic bacteria, allotolerant anaerobes, what are those? Those are something right behind, beside, in the, in front, among these middle, right in the middle. So let's say microaerophilic. Microaerophilic, this bacteria can only survive 2 to 10% of oxygen. If more than that, it will be died. The one major affordable pathogen belonging to microallophilic is Campylobacter. This is a very ironic pathogen. Campylobacter is a major pathogen for the poultry processing. The United States Department of Agriculture for the Safety Inspection Service, we call USDA, FSIS, you maybe heard about sometimes, Capital matter have to be less than 10.4% of raw poultry carcass. However, it is very ironically, this bacteria is very difficult to grow in the lab. The reason is this they are very picky for this oxygen. The oxygen has to be between 2 to 10%. If more than that or less than that, both the bacteria will be dying. And we do the research all the time. We find it very interesting. This pathogen does not grow in the meat very well. However, it grows on the skin surface very well. So it's a very magic bacteria. And it's very ironic. You have these requirements. However, it's very difficult to grow in the lab. So how are we going to do the research? So that is a kind of like a magic stuff in the world. And then luckily, we have some special Bacteria median can do the cultivation, and we have anaerobic jaw. We're gonna to get to that real quick. Can do that. Now another one, which is called allotolerant anaerobes. That one is grow equally well with or without oxygen, which means oxygen does not really care about them. Now why? The reason is that allotolerant anaerobe and the microallophile they both have SOD. However, they have none or limited amount of the catalyst. So basically, those two cannot survive with H2O2. So that's why, in a limited condition, they can grow. And the growth condition is very tricky. We also call those a fastidious bacteria. And we will mention real quick. OK, so this is talking about the oxygen requirements for the bacterial growth. So we mentioned about that. There's a, a why strict anaerobacteria 
cannot grow in the presence of oxygen because it likes superoxidase dust mutates in the catalyst. Now, how they grow it in the lab, I said it's very ironic, it's difficult to grow. There is a two different major tools we can do. Number one is you look at the slides right there. This is a chamber. That chamber is usually $25,000. Um, the university in the south part of the United States, like Auburn University, Mississippi State, North Carolina State University, Texas AM, and the University of Georgia, they usually have those big chambers there because they are doing the research for capillary bacteria all the time. And it is a good chamber to create microallophilic environment for the bacterial growth. This is a job we have in the lab, which is to generate anaerobic environments. So how they do, there is a gas pack. The gas pack, I'm going to put in the water there. So we put usually 10 ml of water there. It will generate hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Then hydrogen will react to the with oxygen, then generate the water, so the oxygen is gone. And now we want this reaction happens real quick. So what we do? We add the palladium. The palladium is a catalyst. And I call it a quotation mark like an enzyme. Not really an enzyme, but the quotation mark is an enzyme because it let oxygen and the hydrogen react with water more quickly. So once the oxygen is all gone, this chamber, this jar, becomes anaerobic. But how do we know there is no oxygen? So we need some of the gas indicator. What are they? Methylene blue. The methylene blue originally is blue color. When it's become colorless, which means there is no oxygen. Another one we can put is resazurin. The, the resazurin originally is pink. Once it's become colorless, which means there's no oxygen. Okay, so these are the very uh, briefly introduced about the anaerobic microbes. This is I'm going to talk about real quick about the biofilm. Most of the bacteria we grow in the lab, we call it a vegetative bacteria. That bacteria grow in the uh, grass or on the agar. Here is uh, some of the bacteria grow usually in, on the surface, and in a poor nutrition matrix formation, we call it biofilm. So what happened is that on the skin, on the surfaces, let's say on the bench, you more or less have some moisture. Then the bacteria will attach to it. Some of the bacteria will be gone, so we call it a deposition. Some of the bacteria will be absorbed. It's a balance. Now the bacteria in this very poor nutrition environments, how they survive, they rely on each other. They rely on cell-to-cell -cell communication. We have a terminology called coring sensing for that. So once they do the coring sensing, they will be absorb some of the oxygen, some of the nut nutrition, and then they start to grow. And finally, it becomes become a polymetric. And this polymetric is very magic. It's become heavy and heavy and heavy, and finally it will be some of them discharged, detached. Most of them will be accumulated there, become a matrix. And the bad thing is they are highly resistant to the sanitizer. So you can imagine in what type of the situation the biofuel will formation is in a meat plant. In the morning, you want to process the ground beef. I want to make a beef product. I find that my bench is not being cleaned yet. And I go read at my daily record. I find that my previous person has not been clean for a week. What happened? The food residue there will have a very nice poor nutrition environment for the bacteria to grow. And the most of the bacteria is Pseudomonas. It's a sporage bacteria. It's natural we'll have the a form filled up. If there is some pathogens there, then we'll be having more strong matrix we'll have there. Then it is very difficult to remove. They so have to use a higher amount of the sanitizer, higher amount of the chlorine concentration to kill them. Because of they do cell-to-cell -cell communication, which is called the chlorine sen sensing, which is gave the big trouble for the food industry. So that's why sanitation is the number one where we get into all kinds of the preventive procedures. For example, HACCP, you talk about, we know, we know about that. 
For example, GMP, and all of, and the, we talk about the FISMAs these, these days, for the Safety and Modernization Act, when you apply all these proactive action, the first thing you need to do is a cleaning and a sanitation. Therefore, we call them a prerequisite program, which is called the Sanitation Standard Operation Procedure, is SSOP. The reason is that we have to prevent the biofilm formation. If the matrix biofilm form up on the surface, it's very difficult to take them out. Okay, so that's a biofilm. Now, which microscope we have to do the observation we have to use is laser confocal microscope because we can see the 3D images of the biofilm. Okay, next, we're going to talk about the spending a majority of the time today. Talk about the bacterial culture media. There is a lot we're going to talk about, and then some of them are confusing, some of them are, are interesting. So we're going to spend lots of time talking about the bacterial culture media, and we will have the lab to practice that. So when we talk about the bacterial media, we are actually talk about is basic identification of the bacteria, of the first step. So let's talk about these one by one, bacteria culture media. So first category is the physical status. Based on the physical status or physical nature of the culture media, we could categorize them, become liquid. This is, you know, bacterial broth. And we talk about in the lab already, the bacterial broth, we have a beef extract. Peptone, trapton, salt, obviously you need water there. The pH usually seven, around the seven, because neutralize the pH, the bacteria can survive in the, or grow in the optimal pH condition. The second is solid. Agar, we talk about this already. Is that right? The solid media is agar. Now, there is another one, which is we call it a semi-solid. We will do this in the lab very briefly. They contain 0.5% of agar. What's the function of this semi-solid agar? Semi-solid media is used to test the bacterial motility. There is a word agar called SIM agar, sulfide endomotility agar. Sulfide endo and the motility. This agar is a semi-solid. Because once you add a bacteria there, which means you do a stab from the top to the bottom, if you see the bacteria right in the middle, there is a no motility, which means there is a monoflagellum, so no motility. If you see a bacteria grow everywhere, that bacteria have a strong motility, which means possibly petrotrichus. That is strong motility. So that's a semi-solid media. This is a physical status or physical nature. Second thing, based on their chemical composition, the bacteria culture could be categorized into two different categories, synthetic, or we call it a defined media, and B category is a complex medium. Now here is a very simple quiz for you. A bacterial broth. I have hepton, trapton, beef extract, Salt, water, 
Can you tell me, is this a synthetic or defined media or a complex media? So what is the definition? Synthetic media and defined media is every single chemical is well defined. Otherwise, we call it complex media. So, I have a bacterial broth, let's say, a nu neutron broth. Just say neutron broth. In the neutron broth, I tell you the ingredient is pepto trapton, beef extract, salt, and water. Can you tell me, is this a synthetic defined media or a complex media? Somebody. Clayton, can you tell me? Synthetic is for the bond. That is my question for you. This is a question in the exam, for example. Today's exam is a neutron broth. I tell you, there's a pepton, trapton, beef extract, salt, and water. Okay, if you compose the, let's say I gave you 10%, this is 10%, this may be 20%, this may be 5%, okay, majority of them you add up together, maybe 55%. Okay, let's just give an example. Is this media a synthetic defined media or a complex media? Can you tell me? Synthetic. Why? Because we know the percentage of each and we know what the complete composition is. Okay, that is I get the answer at the beginning every semester. Does somebody tell me the other answer? Is it correct or not? I don't usually ask questions too often, but sometimes I have to ask this one. Does everybody agree this is defined media? Are you 100% sure? Yes, yeah, it's not. Somebody shaking their hand. Every single chemical is well defined, remember? Okay, do you know what is the ingredients in the beef extract? You don't know, is that right? Do you know the detail of the chapter? No. Do you know the detail of pepto? No, so it is not. It is a typical complex medium. Then the question is, what is synthetic and defined media? Look at that. That is a defined synthetic media. Every single chemical is well defined. You know what is a Name of those chemicals, calcium chloride, for example, citric acid, EDTA. And then what is the amount of that? Other than that, when you see tryptophan, pepton, glucose, this is not well defined because we don't know the detailed ingredients, the chemical ingredients of these reagents. Therefore, this is a complex medium. And I want to tell you one thing, synthetic and defined media, we use only in the lab. It is a good media to grow in bacteria first, then put on the surface to grow biofilm, only for lab purpose. Because compared to the complex media, this is a poor nutrition we talk about. Only chemicals. Look at this, I talk about the beef extract. How many nutrients are there? That's like a bacterial media. So you put the beef trimming, in the stew, you cook it, it's, then you cool down. It will be a perfect environment for bacterial growth. So that's why. It is a very good, tricky question. So you understand the fine the media and the complex media. Majority of the media are complex media because we don't know the exact chemicals of those media. Okay, so this is the first thing. Now we're going to tell you what are those? What is the pepton? Protein hydrolysates prepared by partial digestion of very protein sources. Hydrolysates, enzy enzymatic hydrolysis results from the protein. We don't know what it is. Maybe amino acids, maybe peptides, beef extract. What is agar? Polysaccharides, solidified liquid media. And we said that the agar, the key thing is bacteria can grow but cannot eat it and will not degrade it. So that's something. 
The next category is number three. We want to talk. This is the more, most tricky one, is functional category. Based on the functional category, the bacteria media could be separated into four different, uh, four different categories. Number one, support media. Support median is very simple. We support a bacterial growth. Uh, usually, most of the bacteria can grow 35 degrees Celsius 24 hour. Unless fastidious bacteria. Uh, we will talk about this later on and give you some of the examples throughout the semester. Like an example will be TSB, for example. Tropic soil broth. Neutral broth. The one you in the lab is neutral broth. It's a support medium. Most of the bacteria can grow. Only fastidious bacteria not grow. It's the first one. Second one, enrichment bacteria. Or enrichment. Or we say enrich bacteria medium. What are they? What are the examples of blood agar? Because we want the bacteria to grow dramatically for the clinical purpose, okay? Dramatically. How dramatically? Support media usually 10 to the eighth cells per ml. In rich media, it could be reached around the 10 to the 9 to the 10 cells per ml. So we want to talk a little bit about this blood agar. What is blood agar? Blood agar containing 70% sheep blood. Not human blood. Because in 1970s, people did the research find the characteristics of the sheep blood is similar to the human blood. There is a bunch of the nutrition there, especially the honey. All, all kinds of things there. Okay, so we'll let the bacteria grow dramatically. Looks like that, the blood up. Now, when you see those transparent area, that's another story, we will talk about that. You look at here, there is a chocolate agar. Now this is tricky. First of all, you need to know chocolate agar, there is no chocolate there. There is no chocolate there. Nothing. This is not you get a uh, heroin candy, then put you in the bacteria, then become a chocolate agar, no. That name is very confusing. You shouldn't put a quotation mark there. Why? Chocolate agar is blood agar. When you made it, 70% sheep blood, but you heated it at 70 degrees Celsius. Then the whole blood agar, which is originally is red, then turn brownish color. And it looks like chocolate. So chocolate agar, very simple to say, you should say it is a chocolate like agar. Now people want to make fun to you. They took this out. Then become a chocolate agar. But there is no chocolate there. Then the question is why we need that guy? This is to grow 
fastidious bacteria. What are the fastidious bacteria? Which means the bacteria are very tricky. They cannot grow very well in a traditional support media. For example, neutron broth, TSB, Caterpillar bacteria is one of that. We just mentioned them. Another one we will mention real quick, Haemophilus influenza. Cause meningitis. Another one we will mention real quick. Neisseria meningitis. And Neisseria primary. Okay? So that's why it's a chocolate agar looks like that. So this is in which medium? Now we want to talk about the third category, which is differentiated media. Differentiated media, which means the components of the bacterial media have some of the certain ingredients will create, so we say certain ingredients will generate different biochemical reaction. Then the bacterial colony is showing different color. Of colonies. And a very typical example for differentiated media is a McConkey agar and a blood agar. So a very good example is a McConkey agar. We'll talk about it real quick. And a blood agar. McConkey agar, we can based on their reaction. Based on the lactose reaction, it will turn on pink or colorless. You will know the bacteria whether they do the fermentation of lactose or not. Blood agar, we can separate them into alpha, beta, and gamma hemolytic. We'll talk about these de detail uh, in one by one in a second. So that's a differentiated media. Number four category, selective media. Selective media, which means there is a certain ingredient, certain ingredients only favor certain bacteria. Others will be killed. For example, Makaki agar. Only Gram-negative bacteria will grow. For example, if I have a TSA, tropical soil agar, I have a tropical soil agar, I'm going to add 100 parts per million ampicillin. Then, it is only <coughs> ampicillin resistant bacteria will grow. Others will die. That's an example of selective media. <coughs> okay, now, here is the thing. When we talk about this one by one, it looks like it's easy to understand. But is the real life is a bacterial media is never gonna fit only one category. They always will be a multiple function combination. That makes it difficult. So we are introduced to several bacterial media one by one. Okay, so I'm gonna remove this part out and talk about these one by one. Some very important bacterial media 
And later on, a couple of weeks later in the lab, we were practicing some of them. Okay? So I'm going to move out here too. So we want to talk about this one by one. So first, very simple, straightforward. Makanghiago. And we just said, Makanghiago is a complex medium. Because the ingredients, we don't know, there are some ingredients. So it's a complex medium. That's from the physical nature. <coughs> but from the functional nature, this is a selective medium. Why? Only gram negative bacteria grow. The reason is it has a major ingredients inside of this media is crystal violet. Now do you know why? Because crystal violet will be attacking peptidoglycan of gram-positive bacteria, is that right? Think about your gram stain. Once you stain the bacteria, you're also curing the bacteria. If you understand it this way, you're more understandable for, these to, for this concept. Crystal violet will attacking, attaching heavy peptidoglycan of gram positive bacteria. So only gram negative bacteria will grow. So for example, E. coli, salmonella will grow very well. E. coli, salmonella. And Enterobacter. Okay. Enterobacter. That is a selective medium. Second, Macantiago is also a differentiated medium. Uh, this is also a little bit of tricky stuff. You can look at the ingredients there. There are the ingredients called lactose. Can you see it? Because of the lactose. Lactose could be fermented or not fermented. If the lactose is fermented, it will generate lactic acid. So generate the acid. Okay, how do we know the acid is generated? We are adding a pH indicator in this medium, which is we call it a neutral red. And once the acid is generated, the lactose is generated, this neutral red will turn pink. So if you see pink colony there, is lactose fermentation possible? Now, Makanki agar is a very tricky one. Makanki agar, it has the ingredients of lactose. So, if you see a commercial product, which is just called Makanki agar, then this agar containing lactose. So, at the beginning when you learn, you don't know too much about that. This is Makanki lactose agar. Then people think you're very smart. They took this out. They always do like that. Then become a Makanki agar. Now, why I want to say this? Because there's another Makanki called Sorbito Makanki, using a lot in the lab. Sorbito Makanki. This Makanki agar, there is no lactose there. Instead of, they have Sorbito, a modified sugar. 
Now why it is important? These agar is to differentiate a major bacteria, E. coli 0157H7. This pathogen is zero tolerance in ground beef. You heard about the news all the time. There's an E. coli 0157 outbreak. So there's a recourse from Fox News, CNN all the time. They will generate Shigate toxin. This Shigate toxin will be attached to CB3 in the kidney. Cause of disease is called hemorrhagic uremic syndrome, HUS. Back in 1993, the Jack in Box in Seattle, there is undercooked beef patty is curing four less than four years old kids. That's the most tragic stuff in the United States history for the food safety. E. coli 0157H7, this guy, they grow on the general Makankiaga. It is pink colony. And when this guy grow on Sobito Makanki, It is colorless. Why pink? Because they can do lactose fermentation possible. They can do lactose fermentation. Why colorless? They cannot do sorbitol. So sorbitol fermentation negative. Then you're going to ask me why the sorbitol makanki is important. Because instead of you having E. coli 0157, I have those O126, O23, O11, all these type of things. This is called the NA 0157 STEC, Shigate Toxin Generated E. coli. Those STEC is pink colony on so. Beto Makanki. That's why it is important. So if you want to do a conclusion, this is E. coli 0157H7. This is non-0157 STEC, Shigate Toxin Generated E. coli. I have a Makanki agar right here. I have a sorbitol makanki. This is pink, colorless, and this is colorless and pink. Is that right? That's why it is important. Okay. Now, in your textbook, lots of the people say bile salts is a selective agent. I don't think it's really. Salts a little bit of curing bacteria cause uh, osmotic imbalance, but it is not really. So you can see here, they say there is a shadow gonna come out, a little bit of precipitation up there because of bile salts. It's very difficult to see, and I tell you. But here you can see lactose is using, so it's a differentiated medium. Pink colony. That's E. coli grow on the McConkey algae. Okay, next one, what I want to mention is a blood algae. Okay, so what is blood algae? Blood algae we already talked about. It's an enriched medium because of blood. In 1970s, people find it can grow bacteria dramatically. But why in the clinical area it's so important? Because it's a differentiated medium. I should use red. Um, it's a differentiated medium. Blood agar, based on their hemolytic of blood cell, they could categorize the three different categories. We 
Because alpha hemolytic. This is incomplete. Hydrolysis of blood cell. So sometimes showing you a little bit of dark green color of the colony. A very good important example is streptococcus ammonia. That's alpha hemolytic. The second category, we call it beta hemolytic. Beta hemolytic is complete, completely hydrolyzed, hydrolysis of blood cell, generate a trans parent zone. A good example, streptococcus pyogenes. This guy causes strep throat. This is most reason, the most frequently excuse you're not attending the AEM 341 lab before COVID-19, you have a strep throat. Because streptococcus pyogenes is beta hemolytic. Another category is gamma hemolytic. Gamma hemolytic is basically, we say it's a non-hemolytic. Nothing will happen. Which bacteria? Enterococcus facilium. That's gamma hemolytic. This is a passage used to belong into streptococcus because cause urinary traction in factor, cause 